Hi everyone, Gemma Ware here, one of the hosts of The Conversation Weekly. Today we're playing part two of a series called Uncharted Brain, Decoding Dementia, which first aired on The Ant Hill, a podcast from The Conversations team in the UK. You can listen to this episode without having listened to part one, but if you want to listen to them in order, do jump back into The Conversation Weekly feed where you can find the first episode. Okay, here's part two. Dementia can be frightening for the person who has it, but I know firsthand it can also be very scary for their loved ones. They have to watch the person they know fade into a shadow of their former self. When my grandma had dementia, I felt kind of one step removed from it all. It's usually the son, daughter or spouse who has to deal with the grim administrative and medical reality. Grandchildren often aren't involved in the day-to-day care. They just see the decline. Dementia flips years of people's lives upside down as they struggle to help their family member cope. These years can overtake the happiest memories they have of a person and leave people with lasting sadness. But dementia doesn't just affect older people. It can also hit people much younger. And when that happens, the families are often unaware of what's going on. You're listening to the second episode of Uncharted Brain, Decoding Dementia, a series from The Conversation, hosted by me, Gemma Ware, and Paul Keevney, Investigations Editor at The Conversation. In this episode, we wanted to explore some stories of families dealing with dementia. Paul, in the last episode, we looked at decades of data and what it's revealing about people who develop dementia. And so now in this episode, you've been focusing on the loved ones of people who are suffering from it. That's right. Perhaps one of the best places to start is the world of sport. And that's because a number of sports have been in the spotlight in recent years when it comes to protecting players from head injuries and concussion. We've been speaking to researchers who are studying the families of different types of athletes whose lives have been affected by sports-related head injuries resulting in dementia. And I've been hearing more and more about this in relation to sports like rugby, which I just say I'm a big fan of. There seems to be a lot more attention paid to concussion than there used to be. And there's actually an ongoing court case with a group of players with early onset dementia who are suing rugby governing bodies for negligence over this issue. But has this particular type of dementia got a specific name? It has. It's called CTE or chronic traumatic encephalopathy. A form of dementia athletes from a whole range of sports can develop. It's something that is brought on by not only contact to the head, but head movement that can create this trauma in the brain, which can have real damaging effects, particularly on people who play sport. This is researcher Matt Smith. He's a senior lecturer in sport and exercise psychology at the University of Winchester. CTE might seem like a new term to people, but we've known about the condition for a while. In the 1920s, researchers referred to brain injuries in retired boxers as punch drunk syndrome. And the rugby players are the first people to raise the alarm. In 2002, American football player Mike Webster died. Researchers examined his brain and found he died of a heart attack after his physical and mental health had rapidly deteriorated. Years later, former NFL players sued the league claiming they received head injuries in their careers which caused long-term mental problems. Head-to-head collisions feel like an obvious way to damage the brain. But a growing number of studies show this brain damage may occur from repeatedly heading the ball in football or being tackled in rugby. Because whether it's a sport like American football or rugby where you're getting direct contact to the head or you're in a sport where the head is being jolted back, that, that can create this trauma in the brain. What Matt's talking about there is the brain hitting the inside of the skull and the damage this creates. A couple of years ago, Matt and his colleagues began investigating the experiences of families of sports players who'd suffered from head injuries. He and a team of researchers went to an event at the Concussion Legacy Foundation in the US and they focused on talking to people who had lost loved ones after they developed CTE. Mainly it was women who'd lost their partner 
and who'd been playing sport for most of their lives. Their story really started when they noticed a behavioural change. The behavioural changes can be severe. Sometimes it's rage, sometimes it's erratic choices, or sometimes it's confusing behaviour at a get-together with friends. To understand these, Matt and the team spoke with several family members at an event in Orlando, Florida. These interviews were organised through Lisa McHale. She's the Director of Family Relations at the Concussion Legacy Foundation in the US. And Lisa has her own story. She was married to NFL player Tom McHale. The two first met at Cornell University. I don't recall being one of those, you know, young ladies who spends a whole lot of time fantasizing about being swept off their feet. But I'll I'll tell you, I do recall very clearly feeling like a good part of my life with Tom felt like I was living in a kind of fairy tale. He was good. He was kind. He was smart. He was engaging. He was interesting and yet interested in you. He, I mean, despite all of his accomplishments, he was incredibly humble. The two fell in love, married and started a family while Tom developed his career in the NFL. He played for nine years before retiring. I was just so pleased that my boys were fortunate to have this man as their dad because what an extraordinary role model he would be. And and, and as a spouse, he just, you know, we obviously, we, we had disagreements here and there, but we were abundantly happy. When did you notice things start to change in him? That is always, Paul, the hardest question to answer, right? Because in it, you know, living it in, in the midst of it, there was just so much I'm sure that, that went on that I just, um, I just didn't have the perspective of what was happening. When I, it became abundantly clear to me was when he, he admitted to me that he was feeling very depressed. Tom had retired in the 1996 season. After retirement, he achieved his childhood dream of opening a restaurant. But Lisa remembers things noticeably changing around 2001. He told her he wanted to get out of the restaurant industry. And this was scary. They had three boys and the oldest had special needs. He was also dealing with physical pain from his football career and a doctor had prescribed him strong pain medication. He later admitted to Lisa that he'd become addicted. The drug abuse and addiction certainly made it all come to a head. Essentially, the best way for me to describe it is Tom became more and more sort of disengaged from life. The perspective now is I can look back and... It's just this lethargy, this failure to to drive any enjoyment from all the things that typically brought him a great deal of happiness. So even engaging with the children, it just seemed more like he was going through the motions. And he would come home and there came a point that he wasn't sleeping at night. He couldn't. And, and then in the morning, he couldn't get out of bed. And this is from a person who it used to be that he would get up and he would accomplish more by 6 a.m. By the time I got up, he would have already worked out. He would, you know, he had. And so it was all very confusing. None of it made sense, Paul. And because at the time I had no knowledge of CTE, we had no idea what was going on. And none of this made sense. Did you have any inkling as you were going through this at all that it could have been something linked to his his sporting career? No. Before Tom, only a handful of other NFL players had been diagnosed with CTE, so it wasn't actively talked about. And there's another caveat. CTE can only truly be diagnosed after someone dies and researchers study their brain. In 2008, 12 years after Tom retired from the NFL, he died aged 45 from an accidental drug overdose. When he died, it was, um, 
well, <laughs> it it was um, it was earth shattering. You know, I don't let my mind go back um, very often to the moment when I learned um, to the experience of having to tell our family, to the experience of having to tell the boys. I typically try to avoid those memories because they hurt so bad still to this day. And um, when I consider how tragic to lose Tom in our lives, it 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 really hurts. After he died, Lisa received a request that felt completely out of left field. Researchers at Boston University School of Medicine asked to study his brain for signs of damage and CTE. I asked his family and and they were all in agreement that if it was something that would benefit future generations or whatever the case may be, that Tom most certainly would want to be a part of that. I remember thinking, well, you know, Tom... And I probably said this to him, Tom never had any concussions, but I would imagine you need control subjects, right? Because I really believe, I knew why Tom died. Tom died because of, you know, addiction. When they came back, they said, you know, Tom did have this disease of chronic traumatic encephalopathy, and he had a pretty severe case, pretty progressed for a 45-year-old. And, you know, now with my understanding of the disease, it, it it has been extremely helpful. I am so grateful that that decision was made, that the brain was donated, that his brain was studied, and that we were given that diagnosis. When he was going through all of this, we had no idea what was going on. Tom and I would sit, you know, and, and, and hours on end talk about, you know, why, you know, what's happening and why. And he didn't know any more than I knew. I literally started to question my memories of all that, that maybe I imagined Tom to be a better person than that he was because... You know, they say love is blind and, you know, and this puppy love and you kind of maybe I didn't notice all these other aspects of him and just focused on the positive because none of this makes sense. The diagnosis of dementia helped Lisa understand these final confusing years of Tom's life. Two years after Tom's death, Lisa joined the Concussion Legacy Foundation. Her job now is to work with other families who have gone through or are going through similar experiences. While it doesn't bring them back, to be able to really appreciate how powerfully important this is to bring some positive meaning to that loss has been incredibly rewarding. I can really relate to what Lisa's saying there, Paul, about at least trying to find some way of helping others who are going through similar experiences. And she's so strong in the way she's managed to talk about Tom and his life and what happened to them. She really is. It must have been so difficult to go through all that. But now she's channeling all that experience to help others. CT does sound like a specific kind of case, right? But it's the same with other forms of dementia like Alzheimer's. It's really hard to get a proper diagnosis unless you do an autopsy on the brain. And that's actually going to be very rare in most cases. And so you're always left wondering what's happening inside my loved one's brain. And that's actually what was going on with my grandma. The term Alzheimer's was mentioned by her doctors and she was on some experimental treatment for it. But we were never really sure that that's what she had. And I think that's what these post-mortem diagnoses are doing. They're kind of giving families like Lisa's a little bit of closure. I think one of the problems that makes it particularly difficult for the families of these athletes is how young they were when they were going through these symptoms. And that's why they put these symptoms down to something else. Mm. And what other experiences have these families had to deal with? Well, Lisa was obviously telling us about her own personal story. And many of the family members of professional athletes have very similar ones. And in some cases, they're very different. Several of these people agreed to interviews with Matt Smith and the research team. 
we also interviewed parents and they were even more emotive, like parents talking about how a son or daughter had taken their lives. So there was definitely an emotive feeling. But there was also, a, in a way, a really nice feeling. The family members, their motivation to almost be interviewed was not only to tell their story, but also if their story could help others. Family members at the Concussion Legacy Foundation's Legacy Huddles shared what exactly they had experienced. Just a range of things that their loved ones did that was just out of the ordinary and just unexpected. Not doing jobs that they said they would do or leaving like papers on the top of a car and forgetting about though or going out to the shops and then getting there and then not realising why they'd gone to the shops. It was very noticeable when the family members talked about how, how just confused they were at the first i mean i can't even imagine that to like have somebody who you're living with every day just suddenly their brain just just effectively doesn't work properly some people talked about their husbands suddenly being prone to rage and various forms of erratic behavior like risky business ventures these interviews are now documented and anonymized for us to read out One weekend, I had 12 big trash bags to go out to the garbage. And I told him when I got up and went to work on Monday morning, I said, those are going out to the trash tomorrow. I came home after work, and he had unpacked every trash bag. I just sat there and I cried. I'd worked a 12-hour day. I said, why did you unpack all that trash? And he couldn't tell me why. He just didn't know. We went to a catered event, and he would take the top of the burger bun off, take the meat out to eat, put the bun back, and then go to the next one. Someone caught him and was like, what is he doing? Of course, we never got invited back to any of those people's homes. No one wanted to have anything to do with him because they couldn't understand him. As one family member talked about her husband urinating in a public place in front of other people, just not realising what he was doing and and so in those instances they talked about not being able to go out socially so their lives you can sort of see how these behaviors would start to impact on social lives and the way they live their life this is a condition that affects everybody involved in this not only the sports people themselves but their family members so that's that's the first take-home message that As a societal issue, it's not just affecting. So if somebody plays sport and this happens to them, then it's going to have a real massive knock-on effect to other people they're involved in. Paul, earlier Lisa told us that back in the early 2000s, she hadn't even heard of CTE. So do we have a better understanding today of the scale of the issue for athletes? Well... The brain bank at Boston University, where Lisa donated Tom's brain, continues to do its research. And in 2017, the team studied the first 202 donated brains, and 177 of those were diagnosed with CTE. That's astonishing. That's nearly all of them. Were there some sports where the athletes were particularly affected? Well, from the 111 brains donated by NFL players, all but one was diagnosed with CTE. This same research centre found in a later study that every year of playing full-tackle American football increases the risk of developing CTE by 30%. So that's a really clear risk developing there. But now we know this, how are things changing in these high-risk contact sports? People are talking about making changes to various sports now. There's the rugby lawsuit you mentioned earlier, And that's been going on since 2020. But rugby isn't just about these professionals who are suing at the professional bodies. Kids also play it. It's mandatory in in several schools in the UK. And I know it can be rough. I actually played rugby at university and (laughs) quit because of all the bumps and bruises I got. So is there any evidence that younger people, that kids are being affected by CTE too? Well, the Brain Bank in Boston has brains from donors as young as 14 who it is believed have been exposed to brain traumas, primarily from playing sports. Does that mean that these kids as young as 14 have already developed a form of dementia? 
I was talking to Matt about that, and they think it's likely that those younger donors had sustained concussions or some form of head injuries, and that's why the families had these suspicions based on their behaviour and why they ended up reaching out to Boston. And Matt believes that the younger age groups is where we particularly need to see this shift when it comes to the games that they're playing. So at the professional level, when it's visible, people are being challenged to protect themselves. Where the shift needs to happen, from my understanding, is at junior level and at grassroots level, where people still have the attitude a lot of the time of, I want to play, get me back on the pitch, rather than the brave thing to do is actually acknowledge that you need to sit out to protect your brain longer term the reality is that young children can't consent when you're 18 then you make your own decisions if you want to smoke you smoke if you want to drink you drink but what needs to happen is people at least need to make informed decisions and they need to know the risks so one of the campaigns going on with uh, rugby players in the UK is that they're arguing that they played a sport where they weren't aware of those risks and now they've got these head injuries they didn't know what they were getting themselves in for and they were being allowed to play a sport that was damaging Lisa, of course, is now very aware, and so are her sons, and that's why they don't play tackle American football. I think the most important thing that the NFL should do is to stop encouraging children to play. Stop recruiting our five and six and seven-year-olds to play this game. It's a game that should be played by adults. And I would say the same to parents, that if your child really, really, really wants to play football, play other forms of the sport, play non-contact forms of the sport, at least through high school. So we have seen some changes I mentioned earlier that a group of players sued the American National Football League and that case led to the NFL reaching a $1 billion settlement with the players. Okay, so it seems things are changing in the sports and there's recognition of this issue. But what about the family members who are still having to deal with the trauma of a loved one who has early onset dementia? Is the research that Matt and his colleagues are doing finding any answers to help these families? Well, Matt is hoping to find more ways of helping them through the research they're doing because the people they spoke to seemed really open about the way they shared their personal stories with him. It gave them a chance to reflect on what happened to them and really importantly, it gave them a chance to help others by raising awareness about this condition and how it can affect families. The interesting one is for people who are going through it now and how they can best be supported We're currently running a letter writing project where we've got family members to write sort of reflective letters back to their younger self about what advice they'd give their younger selves. We're working on using those letters to create a resource, basically a composite set of letters that almost gives advice to people going through that. So the next stage for us directly with family members is how we can best support family members going through it. Paul, I think it's one thing to watch one of your own family who's diagnosed with dementia when they're in their 70s, 80s, 90s, like, and they've had a long life. But someone in their 40s with young kids, that is just so, so tough to deal with, particularly when they got it, probably, from playing a sport that they loved and made a career out of. That's exactly right. And I guess it goes to show that there are just so many different reasons why a person might develop dementia, from the risk factors we were hearing about in that first episode, to concussion, what we've been speaking about today, or head injuries. Researchers are still trying to get to the bottom of it, and that's what we're going to hear about in the next episode. Looking for a virus, probably in a very small region of the brain, is like looking in a needle of a haystack. Okay, that's it for part two of Uncharted Brain, Decoding Dementia. We'd like to thank Lisa McHale for sharing her story and Matt Smith for talking to us about the study. You can read an article written by Matt and his colleagues on the conversation. We'll put a link in the show notes. This series originally ran on The Ant Hill, which is a podcast from the Conversations team in the UK, which publishes in-depth series drawn from academic research. Tiffany Cassidy is the producer of the Uncharted Brain series and our sound designer is Eloise Stevens. 
Alice Mason does our social media, and our designers are Zoe Jazz and Gita Zimmerman. I am the executive producer for the series. If you like what we do, please support The Conversations podcast by going to donate.theconversation.com. You can also find us on Twitter at TC underscore audio and on Instagram at theconversation.com. Thank you for listening and stay tuned for part three in The Conversation Weekly Feed. <laughs>